My name's Dave Crenshaw. I, uh, I am from uh, Utah. I have three children and, and uh, one wife. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, he, he mentioned a little bit about how I help business owners uh, overcome chaos. Uh, I've been featured in Time Magazine, Forbes, uh, the BBC, um, MSN Money, a few other places. I have three books. Most recent that came out is The Focused Business. But of all the accolades that I've received, there's one that I'm most proud of. And uh, that is, uh, anyone know any uh, Chuck Norris facts in the room? Right? You know what a Chuck Norris fact is. It's a made-up fact about Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris uh, makes onions cry. Chuck Norris made a milkshake once. It registered 8.9 on the Richter scale. Well, it turns out that in the official Chuck Norris fact book, Chuck referenced me in my work on the myth of multitasking under the Chuck Norris fact that Chuck can kill two stones with one bird. So just remember, if you don't like this presentation, uh, Chuck may not be my biggest fan, but he is my most dangerous fan, and we may need to bring the blimp out and drop him down on you at some point. Now, that's a little bit about me. I want to get to know you. I want to ask you a question and write down your answer in the notepad that you've got. If you had an extra 40 hours per month, essentially an extra work week every single month, what would you do with that extra time? How many of you would put down something like uh, spend time on hobbies? Spend time with family or loved ones, right? Do more work? There are a few of you sick people here in the audience. How many, uh, honestly, the first thought you had was sleep more? Right. Okay. I, I know that answer having three children. Now, the reason why I start with that is because during this presentation, well, during this presentation, I'm going to be able to get you about five to ten hours per month. Uh, he didn't mention this, but I have a breakout session later today as well. And I'm going to go into specific strategies, and we'll be able to get much more of that 40 hours per month. Does that sound like a good thing to you? Okay. The second thing I'd like to do to get to know you is I found that there are three groups of people that I work with when it comes to productivity. The first group I call the Zen Master. And they have always been organized, always been in control of their time and their space. In fact, the concept of time management is a little unnecessary to them. How many of you would put yourself into the Zen master category by raise of hand. The tumbleweeds run through the room. I know that there's one or two humble Zen masters here. So for those one or two people, if I can help the rest of these screwed up people make your life a little less miserable, would that be of value to you? Okay? The second group I call the wanderer. And the wanderer is someone who is inherently organized. They, are, they have the heart and soul of a Zen master, but something's happened in the last few years, hasn't it? You've lost your way, and you're not quite sure where you got off track, but all of a sudden, you used to be organized, you used to be on time, and now you can't do that anymore. How many of you would put yourself into the wanderer category? Great. If I can show you where you got off track and show you how to get back to that place of order that you crave, would that be of value to you? And then the last group I call the pig pen. And the pig pen has never, people are already raising their hands. <laughs> Proud pig pens. You've never been organized. You've never been really that good with time management. It's not to say that you haven't been successful. It's just that you've learned to succeed in spite of your natural tendency to create chaos. How many of you would put yourself into that category? Yeah. And the rest of you are unemployed. <laughs> now, for those of you who are pig pens, what I'm going to do is show you how to get that order and that time management that, that you really do need, but without sacrificing your creativity and your ability to build relationships. Now, the reason why I start with these three groups is to also help you understand which group I fit into. Now, if you saw the way that I operated now, you would think me a Zen master, 100% all the way. But the reality is I am a pig pen through and through. It's my natural tendency to create chaos and disorder everywhere I go. You used to have to use a shovel to get from the door of my office to the desk. And the chaos extended far beyond just my physical workspace. It was also a career issue. I was jumping from path to path to path, including at the bottom there, if you can see that picture, trying to be a rock star. 
My wife supported me for a few years while I had a band. I was jumping all over the place. And it was about the point where my first child, my son, I knew he was going to be born. So this was approximately nine years ago that I realized something needed to change. I could not do this to my family. I could not support them with this kind of behavior. So I did what all screwed up people do. I saw a shrink, right? And I went and sat down with him, and he he gave me a test. And he said, that's really interesting, but I want to make sure, let me give you another test. He gave me another test. And then he said words I'll never forget. This is word for word. He said, has anyone ever talked to you about ADHD? You are freaking off the charts, ADHD. If there were a fifth standard deviation, you'd be in it. I can say with 99.99% accuracy, you've got it. Now, the reason why I start with this story is not because my presentation is about ADHD. It's because we live in a world, as Seth Godin put it on, the, on, on a quote in my book, we live in an ADHD world, right? This is the reality of our day. And only 4 to 8% of the population actually has the genetic condition known as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So what about the rest of you? Where is this behavior coming from? And more importantly, what is it costing you? There's a number that's very important for you to learn. The number is 28%. Uh, This number comes from BaseX Research, which is a research firm out of New York that studies human productivity. And what they found is that the average knowledge worker, that's anyone who's not hammering a nail or lifting a shovel, the average knowledge worker loses 28% of their day due to interruptions and the recovery time associated with those interruptions. I'm gonna use the term switches and switching costs, but it's the same thing. And this has everything to do with that first question that I asked you about what you would do with that 40 hours a month. This is that time, that 28%. We're gonna do a little exercise together right now to simulate what's happening in your day and where that time is going. You should have a a piece of paper in front of you It'll say uh, multitasking exercise at the top, and it says multitasking is worse than a lie. If for some reason you can't find it, just grab a piece of paper and draw three lines across it horizontally like that. That's all you need is four rows. Now you'll see the phrase on that worksheet that says multitasking is worse than a lie. Let me explain where that comes from. In my book, The Myth of Multitasking, I paraphrase Mark Twain. Mark Twain is credited with saying there are lies damned lies, and statistics, right? I say there are lies, damned lies, and multitasking. Multitasking is worse than a lie. It's worse than a damned lie. Because even in a group full of highly educated people like this, my guess is at some point you've heard multitasking's a bad thing, right? You've heard the radio, NPR talking about it, you've read a news article, you've heard this. But has it changed your behavior? More importantly, has it changed the behavior of the people around you? That's why this is worse than a lie, is because it's the cultural norm. And this group, this room right here, is going to start the change happening. So here's our little exercise that we're going to do together. This is timed, so don't start until I say go. You're going to recopy the phrase, multitasking is worse than a lie in the first row. And then you're going to write the numbers, 1 through 27, in the second row. That's one number for every letter in the phrase, multitasking is worse than a lie. That's it. Got it? Get ready, get set, and go. Five seconds. 10 seconds. 15. 20 seconds, 25, 30, we'll go five more, and 35. Most of you are done at this point. Great, now we're going to do this again, but this time we're going to simulate what really happens when you think you're multitasking. See, what most people are really doing when they think they're multitasking is switch tasking. 
you're switching rapidly back and forth between these tasks because your brain is only able to handle one active task at a time. So we're going to simulate that. Next exercise that we're going to do here is we're going to write one, we're going to do the same thing. Multitasking is worse than a lie, 1 through 27. But for every letter that you write, you're going to write a number. M, and then you'll write 1, and then U, and then 2, and L, and then 3, and so on. Got it? And this will be timed again. Okay, ready? Get set, and go. Five seconds. Ten seconds. Fifteen. Twenty seconds. Twenty-five. Thirty seconds. Thirty-five, this is where we were when we stopped last time. Forty. Forty-five seconds. Fifty. Fifty-five seconds. Sixty, we'll go five more. And 65, and if you're not done now, just give up. <laughs> I love doing this with a large group like this because you start to hear how the energy changes in the room when we do this, right? Now let's talk about the, three, the first three effects of multitasking. Number one is the most obvious. What was it? Time, right? The amount of time it takes to complete things when you switch task increases somewhere in this exercise in the neighborhood of 50 to 100% for some of you. Now, this is a fun little scenario, but what really happens in your day? This is what happens in your day. You'll be sitting at their computer typing away at an email. Someone walks in and they say, I'm sorry, I've got just a quick question, right? I call that the dreaded double Q, the quick question. So you stop what you're doing. You answer the question. The answer is 42. Thank you very much. See you later. Thanks for those of you who got that reference. Now what do I need to do? Where was I? What was I thinking about? Where was I typing? Or if you're off the charts ADHD like me, you'll completely forget you have an email on the screen, pick up a piece of paper over here, work on that piece of paper, and two hours later you have an unfinished email on your screen. Right? Whenever you switch, because of switching cost, the amount of time it takes to complete things increases. Effect number two, quality. Be honest. How many of you ended up on a number other than 27, <laughs> right? Now, we practiced this before. I gave you clear instructions. I give you written instructions, an example, and you still screwed it up. Whenever I see highly intelligent people making very dumb mistakes, that is a symptom of switch tasking, not incompetence. Number three, this one's not quite so obvious until I ask you to think about it, but consider how you felt between the first and second time that we did this, right? Your stress levels increased. The first time I was calling out numbers and it was no big deal. How many of you wanted to shoot me as I was calling out the numbers the second time, right? Stop that. Because all of a sudden, just introducing this one thing of switch tasking, it becomes difficult and painful and laborious. Is it little wonder that we live in a world that has so many time-saving devices and so many stress-relieving outlets, and yet we feel we have less time and we're more stressed out than we've ever been in the history of the world. And who's to blame for this? Al Gore. <laughs> right? He invented the internet. No, it's us. It's the choices that we're making. And in the breakout session, I'll get into specific strategies on how to overcome this. Now, there's one more effect, a fourth effect, that we need to discuss, and we're gonna simulate that right here. But first of all, before we do that, just to recap, number one, when you switch tasks, the amount of time it takes to complete things increases. The quality of your work decreases and your stress levels increase. So here's the fourth effect. What I'd like you to do is find your GCP. That's your geographically convenient partner. 
Turn and locate that person. Make eye contact with them. Not too long. Now what I'd like you to do, give me your attention, is for 20 seconds, I want one of you to tell the other person about a hobby that you enjoy doing. Or if you can't think of that, just tell them about your family. 20 seconds. Ready? And go. And five, four, three, two, one, stop. Give me your attention. Okay, now we're going to switch this again. We're going to do this again, but just like we did last time, we're going to add switch tasking to the equation. So, this time the person who was listening, I want you to talk to the other person, tell them about a hobby or your family member, but the person who's listening, I want you to switch task. Play with your phone, play with your papers, do something else while the person is talking to you. 20 seconds. Ready, get, set, go. And five, four, three, two, one, and stop. All right, give me your attention. My time is short, please. Now, in one word, those of you who are being switch tasked upon, how did that make you feel? Disrespected? Ignored? <laughs> it's getting hostile over here. All right, please give me your attention. In one word, what I usually find is it can be summed up in this, unimportant, right? Now, imagine this scenario for me. You wake up, you go down to breakfast, at breakfast, you turn to your significant other and you say, hi, honey, you're unimportant. What are you gonna do today? <laughs> or you pick up the phone. You say, thank you for calling XYZ company. You're unimportant. How can I help you? Now, you'd never do that, right? But you do that, right? Whenever you multitask or switch task on a human being, you're communicating to them that they're less important than anything else you could be doing at that time. Now, I'm going to finish with a story here. I am a huge NFL fan. And one day, we were watching the Super Bowl. I was really into the game. We had guests over. I was so excited watching it. We had the chips and the dip and all that stuff. And I'm just really into it. I look down and I see this. That's my son when he was two. And he held up a book about Eskimos. And he said, Daddy, read story? In the middle of the Super Bowl. Are you kidding me? Now, what would you do in this situation? I had four options pass through my mind. Number one, DVR, not an option. We had friends in the room. Number two, go away, kid. Don't bother me. I'm watching the Super Bowl. Number three, I multitask, right? Good parenting. Put them on my lap. I read the story, and, uh, and the Eskimos went fishing, and touchdown! Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. But I know that there are four effects of multitasking. Number one, the amount of time it takes to complete things increases. The quality of the experience decreases. My stress levels increase and relationships decrease. So I went with the fourth option, which is sit them on my lap and read them the story. You know how long it took me? About three minutes. Now, I don't know what I missed during that time, whether it was a, a sack or a fumble or an interception or a funny beer commercial. But what I do know and what, the, what my son knew was that I had nothing better to do than focus on him for those three minutes. And when I was done, he said, thank you, Daddy, and went and did whatever two-year-olds do. These are the opportunities that you have every single day and that you will have the moment this presentation is over to give people 100% of your attention and to communicate to them that there's nothing more important than they, than they are. And that becomes a powerful differentiator in an ADHD world. Thank you for listening.